Hi, I'm Steve Sandler, the founder of AEI Systems, a company that specializes in modeling, analysis, and simulation. A large part of our focus is on analog and power electronics, though we support RF and instrumentation as well, primarily for the high reliability arena. In our business, we're frequently called on to assess and troubleshoot system level issues, many of which are related to the power distribution network. The causes of the customer issues are generally covered in this very short list. In a previous video, I discussed the two main options for measuring impedance in the frequency domain. The Frequency Response Analyzer, or FRA, and the Vector Network Analyzer, or VNA. I then proceeded to explain the benefits of using VNAs to measure impedance of devices in counted and distributed power networks, interconnect requirements for making high fidelity VNA measurements, and described how to perform and interpret one port impedance measurements using VNAs. In this presentation, I'll describe how to perform and interpret two port impedance measurements using VNAs. There are two variations of the two port measurement the two port series through and the two port shunt through. We rarely use the series through measurement to never end system because it's only useful for measuring high impedances and requires the DUT, or device under test, to be placed between the two measurement ports. So in this video, we'll focus on the two-port shunt-through measurement, which is the gold standard of measurement, especially for PDN, or power distribution network type applications, such as CPUs and FPGAs. However, this technique can also be applied to measuring the PDN for ADC clocks and other high performance circuits. The limitation is the maximum measurement impedance of several tens of ohms. The two port shown through measurement connects both VNA ports to the device under test, or DUT, forming a voltage divider between the RF precise port impedances and the DUT for accurate wideband measurements from approximately 100 microohms to a few tens of ohms. This is the measurement performed by designers for the PDN assessment of VRMs and POLs. Much has been written about this measurement by the high power server companies, including Intel, Oracle, as well as Agilent. The Bode 100 can directly display the stability and Q information as a cursor measurement, and like the single port measurement, can be performed at 0 volts and also up to 5 volts. In general, depending on the analyzer used, a common mode transformer is often used to improve the low frequency fidelity of two port shunt through impedance measurements. For those interested in learning more about measuring PDNs or about measuring low impedance values in general, there are many articles and application notes on these topics. A few of these are listed in the reference section at the end of this presentation. This connection diagram shows the two ports of the VNA connected to the DUT with the recommended J2102A common mode transformer. We can use several different techniques to connect the VNA ports to the DUT. In this case, a PCB with two matched 50 ohm strip lines connected a single point, making this a four wire RF measurement. The connection is critical, and in this case, the terminals at the end of the PCB had several nanoheneries of inductance and also a small but finite resistance. There is also a contact resistance between the probe terminals and the duct. It is essential that the 50 ohms of the analyzer be matched all the way from the VNA to the duct in order to maintain the frequency response. And so this measurement is always connected using 50 ohm coaxial cables. For the highest fidelity, two 50 ohm coax cables are soldered directly to the duct. Looking at the test setup, you might wonder why we use a common mode transformer. To answer this question, we need to understand the input outputs of the analyzer. In the case of the E5061B analyzer, Agilent designed the front end with semi-floating input circuitry. This means that they included differential amplifiers at the input with a low offset voltage capability. This is an elegant, though expensive, solution to a simple problem arising from a DC ground loop. Here we have a model of the two-port VNA test setup in which the cables are modeled with inductances and resistances. In the schematic, you can see that the two ports are connected as a true RF ground at the front panel of the analyzer. The two connecting cable shields are connected together at this RF ground, and are also connected together at the device under test or duct. This creates a DC ground loop with the cable shields in parallel with each other and in series with the duct, so that the shields become part of the measurement. Adding the common mode transformer allows some AC float to eliminate this ground loop. 
The J2102A common mode transformer provides very high permeability while maintaining true 50 ohm transmission line characteristics up to approximately 500 megahertz. The low frequency limitation is generally in the 100 hertz to 1 kilohertz range. A differential probe could also be used to a port tube, but at a loss of sensitivity, degrading the SNR of the measurement, making it more difficult to measure low values. Note that with this common mode transformer, we can easily measure impedance values as low as 1 milliohm using this two port shunt through impedance measurement technique. As with the single port measurement, we generally make two port measurements in pairs, and it is most common to measure point of load impedance with and without power applied to the point of load. Here's an example using the LTC3880 DC to DC controller demo board. In this measurement, we can see the off state in the dark red trace and the on state in the faint red trace. From the off state measurement, we can see the load resistance, bulk output capacitance, bulk ESR, the ceramic decoupling capacitance, and the ESL. From the on state measurement, we can see the bandwidth and regulation resistance. We can also see a peaking of the curve labeled 8.2 milliohms, which provides a partial indication of the stability of the control loop. And we see a single anomalous point at approximately 125 kilohertz that tells us something more about the POL's stability. We'll discuss the meaning of these two peaks in greater detail when we return to this measurement in a subsequent video. Notice that using the traditional two-port measurement results in an S-parameter output measured in dB. Port 2 is in parallel with the device under test or DUT, while port 1 is in series. This results in a divider with the DUT at the bottom of the divider and the two port impedances in parallel at the top of the divider. So the measurement is DUT divided by DUT plus 25. We can also calibrate using a 1 ohm resistor providing the results directly in ohms, but limited to approximately 2.5 ohms. In a similar measurement made on a high-end server motherboard, we can see the results from a similar pair of measurements. In this measurement, as in the previous example, we can see the influence of the bulk capacitance ESR and ESL. We can also see the effects of local ceramic decoupling capacitance and their associated ESL. Note that the crossover bandwidth is relatively low at 20 kHz and that the phase margin is ideal as evidenced by the total lack of peaking at the crossover frequency. Since the closed loop gain is the open loop gain divided by 1 plus t, in this case the bandwidth of the closed loop and open loop measurements should be the same. This isn't always the case, as X5R capacitors are often used, and the change in capacitance between the powered and unpowered states can be seen from the two-port impedance measurement. This impedance configuration is sometimes referred to as the classic W, since the shape looks much like the letter W. Measuring inductance values below 140 picohenries requires extreme care in the attachment of the cables to the duct, because coupling between the unshielded portions of the two coax cables can appear as an inductance. In some cases, we'd like to make the two-port measurement at higher voltages. This is often the case in measuring battery impedance and output impedance of intermediate bus converters, input impedance of any DC to DC converter, or EMI filter stability. It's possible to AC couple the two-port measurement allowing measurement at higher voltages with the same accuracy as the DC measurement. In order to AC couple the measurement, at least one DC blocker such as the J2130A is required. The DC blocker is required at the port 1 or oscillator side of the measurement. The port 2 channel using the FRA mode can be set as a high impedance AC coupled port. As in the case of the DC coupled measurement, the common mode transformer is still required unless the analyzer is a semi-floating or floating front end. As we noted previously, the Agilent E5061B has a semi-floating front end and would not require the common mode transformer. Looking at this setup, we should note that there will be some loss of fidelity due to the mismatch of the 50 ohm cable and the high impedance analyzer port. However, we can improve measurement fidelity by terminating port 2 into 50 ohms also. We can do that by adding a second DC blocker, such as the J2130A, for port 2, as shown here. The dark red trace, which is clearly visible here, represents the impedance measurement taken with the optional DC blocker installed on port 2. 
In the screenshot, there's also a faint red trace representing the impedance measurement taken without the optional DC blocker installed. This faint red trace is obscured by the dark red trace since the two impedance measurements match closely across most of the frequency range. However, the faint red trace is visible at the very low and high frequencies where two artifacts can be seen. These artifacts are due to the mismatch that occurs between the 50 ohm cable and the high impedance port 2 when no DC blocker is installed. When we insert the second DC blocker on port 2 and retake the measurement, as seen in the dark red trace, the artifacts due to the impedance mismatch between the cable and port 2 disappear. Just one final note on the AC coupled measurements. We found that when the same measurement was taken with the DC coupled setup, there was very close agreement between the AC coupled and DC coupled results. To measure impedances as low as 1 milliohm requires wide dynamic range. The Bode 100 and Agilent E5061B analyzers are impressive in this regard, with both instruments providing approximately 125 to 130 dB dynamic range. If these instruments are going to be used to measure impedances below 1 milliohm, additional gain is required to improve the dynamic range of the analyzer. In this case, a very low noise amplifier such as PicoTest's J2180A can be used to boost the range by nearly 20 dB without impacting the noise floor. The preamplifier is also used frequently to boost the signals when using near field probes or to convert high impedance scope probes to a 50 ohm port to match RF input ports. The preamplifier provides 20 dB gain from 0.1 Hz to 100 MHz with an average noise density of approximately 2.4 nanovolts per root hertz, as measured here using a Tektronix RSA5106A spectrum analyzer. The bandwidth of both the spectrum analyzer and the VNA are relatively narrow, so that the noise does not contribute to the measurement, allowing the entire 20 dB to be used to boost the dynamic range. In order to show the benefit of the preamplifier, the J2180A and the Bode 100 are combined to measure a precision 250 microohm resistor mounted between two SMA ports. The result measured on the analyzer is quite accurate at 251 microohms and 140 picohenders. As with the other two port measurements, connections must be very carefully made and the calibration must be very accurately performed to minimize stray effects that contribute to the measurement. In general, as the measurement impedance is reduced, the connection and calibration requirements are increased. For those who would like to learn more about two port impedance measurements using VNAs, see the references listed here. And if you have any questions about the information presented in this video, please feel free to email me at steve at picotest.com. Thank you.